give you a little bit about my background. Uh, currently, I'm a scientist emeritus uh, with the US Forest Service. Um, I retired about four years ago. It would be considered early retirement um, uh, for various reasons, but I spent 30 years uh, with the agency. And uh, um, prior to that, so with my education, um, I grew up in the New York City metropolitan area. So um, I'm more of an urbanite than I am anything else. Um, and, but when I was a kid, uh, my parents, we took a road trip out west in the proverbial uh, station wagon back then. Uh, they threw the kids back in the, in the back of the car. Um, and uh, we drove out to Montana and uh, that was my, the summer before my freshman year. And um, I really got enamored with uh, the forests out there and I, you know, wanted to become a forester. And of course, at that time, I didn't know exactly what that was. Um, so, um, but that stuck in my head. And um, when I started looking for colleges and universities, I was looking at forestry colleges and decided to go to SUNY State University in New York, uh, College, uh, Environmental, College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, which is one of the top forestry colleges in the, in the world. Um, and by the time I graduated, um, I realized um, I, I, I was more of an extrovert than an introvert. Um, you know how you learn about yourself in college. And I was like, I don't know if I want to live out in the middle of nowhere and <laughs> be a forester. Um, so I was flipping through the uh, catalog at, at the university campus and uh, on campus and I saw this thing on urban forestry and I was like oh that sounds like a nice merge for me you know guy grew up in New York City area who likes trees maybe I can do this and um, uh, and also my senior year I had a work study program and uh, I uh, worked in the forest soil lab I used to clean glassware and I got to know the graduate students really well um, and so I got very interested in soils. Um, and at the time, I don't even want to tell you what year this was, because then it will reveal my age, but it was uh, 1980. Um, and urban soils um, really was uh, very little work was being done in the States anyway, uh, in Europe and other places. Uh, that was a different story. But in the States, very little urban soil research was being done. Um, and, and, and actually around the world, I mean, there was a more interest um, outside of the States, but um, still wasn't a lot. And I had a professor um, who was interested in urban soils, uh, Phil Crowell, you might have heard of his urban soil textbook. Um, and that's how I learned about urban soils. Um, and uh, so then uh, I did my master's degree in four soils. Um, at the campus, they made me an offer that they, they liked, you know, I, I guess I cleaned the glassware well. <laughs> um, and uh, so, um, and, I, and I did a study there that was uh, indirectly related to urban soils um, and, uh, um, and went to, a, and, and so here's, here's some advice uh, about careers. Um, I went to uh, an urban forestry conference in Cincinnati as a grad student. And it was um, in the early days of urban forestry as well. It was only the second time that they had this national meeting on urban forestry. And I did a poster with a, a colleague of mine on urban soils. And uh, it was great because I got to talk to a lot of different people and got introduced to uh, the field that way. And so this, um, woman comes up and she starts asking me all kinds of questions about urban soils and I had no idea who she was and again this is the very beginning of the idea of an urban soil and um, <clears throat> so she hands so I said you know I can give you more information um, I have you know and back then there was no internet so everything was done by snail mail and I told her, I said, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll mail you um, some more information. 
on urban soils. And she gave me her card and I looked at her card and she was the horticulturist for Central Park, New York City. And I was like, wow, um, that was pretty cool. <clears throat> and I um, worked, put together a package of stuff and I slipped my resume in there and I put a nice letter, cover letter. Um, and a week later, I get a phone call from her. Uh, her name is Geraldine Weinstein. And she's like, very clever of you to slip your resume in there because we were actually looking for somebody who knew something about soils to join the effort in restoring the park. And Central Park had really gotten um, <clears throat> in bad shape in this, uh, by the end of the 70s. And there's this big movement to get it uh, uh, restored. Um, and, and she recognized the, the importance of soils, but they had no information on the soils in the park. And so they were getting the Soil Conservation Service, which is now called the Natural Resource Conservation Service, but back then it was Soil Conservation Service, to do one of the first um, soil surveys of the uh, an urban soil survey. It was being done in the park. And make a long story short, I ended up getting hired. And so that's, you know, so my, my advice to you is go to meetings and talk it up, give presentations, um, and be ready to, you know, do your elevator speech um, and so on and so forth. So when I was there, um, I actually set up one of the first urban soil labs ever. As far as we can tell, we were looking around to see if anybody else was doing this. Um, and, um, and then I got involved with a citywide effort to do an, um, uh, an inventory of all of our parks. Um, and to make another long story short, I met um, uh, an ecologist who was at Rutgers, just graduated from Rutgers University. And he was doing this project in the New York Botanical Garden, uh, which is in the Bronx, New York. And believe it or not, there's a forest there that had never been cut. It's an old growth forest stuck in the middle of the Bronx. Um, and he was doing some research there and he, he talked me into going back for my PhD because <laughs> I had swore to a lot of people after I got my master's, I was not going to go for a PhD. <laughs> so he did, he was pretty persuasive and I'm very glad he did it. Um, and at the same time, the forest service was very interested in what we were doing in New York. So I got all these people involved. And so the forest service covered some of my uh, costs for graduate school, the Institute of Ecosystem Studies, now it's called the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, um, chipped in some money as well. Um, and so you're going to hear about my research uh, in a few minutes. Um, so that's how I ended up. And so I ended up going for a PhD in ecology. My master's degree was in soil science. Uh, my PhD is in ecology. But as an ecologist, um, as a soil scientist who took went on to ecology, I, as it, um, I realized the importance of soils. Um, and so we, I kind of merged the two. And now I call myself basically an ecosystem ecologist uh, who studies urban ecosystems. Um, and I do a lot with soils. Um, I would not call myself a soil scientist in front of a PhD, a crowd of PhDs in soil science, um, because um, I'm not really there yet. Um, so anyway, that's how I got involved with urban soils. That's how I got involved in urban ecology. Um, and uh, I was fortunate to be one of the co original co-PIs of the Baltimore Ecosystem Study. You're going to hear more about that in a minute. And the Baltimore Ecosystem Study is funded by the National Science Foundation, and it's part of uh, a long-term ecological research network, or LT. E -R. And these LTER sites were traditionally established in, you know, natural areas, um, you know, everything from, you know, down in the Everglades all the way up to Alaska, uh, but it was always outside of urban areas. And so Baltimore and Phoenix were the first two urban LTERs, and they were funded um, right when, when I was a postdoc uh, working at the Cary Institute. And so I became one of the co-investigators there. So that's how I got involved. And um, I, uh, uh, I've done all these other tangents um, outside of science. Um, I, I've worked in policy. I've worked in Congress, uh, the US Congress, for example. I worked with Senator Moynihan from New York. Uh, 
Senator Feinstein from California. Um, and I've also worked um, in the Obama administration for the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So uh, was taking all my expertise, uh, I'm working at the policy level in Washington, DC. And I also ended up my career in the Forest Service, working in the main office in the DC headquarters, overseeing uh, soil and air research for the Forest Service. Um, environmental gradients have historically been used in ecology uh, mainly to study plant uh, community composition and how it varies over the landscape. And uh, this is a, people teach a whole course in this kind of thing. So I'm gonna really boil it down. But basically in the early days of plant ecology in, in the States anyway, uh, ecologists were focused at the field level and they were just looking at these competitive interactions between species of plants on a site. Um, and so a lot of the early thinking about wh where plant, why you find plants where they are is based on mostly competitive inter competition and competitive interactions. Um, until Whitaker in 1954, noticed when he was walking up the, down the, the mount, uh, sides of mountains in uh, Smoky National uh, Park, um, he noticed that you would gradually see species becoming more abundant as he was going up the, and, and other species getting less abundant. And it wasn't this, you know, abrupt thing. Um, and so he actually set up uh, transects up and down the mountain. And, uh, and, and because of the environmental gradients that you find in elevation, um, usually temperature, precipitation, solar radiation, things like that, um, the, the species are responding um, at the scale of, of a mountainside to these environmental gradients. And so if you've ever been to uh, Smoky National Park, go there in the fall. I've done this. And in fact, I should have showed you a slide. I could have showed you a picture. But you go, to, go there in the fall, and you can see the species changes up the mountain just because certain species are changing colors before others. And it's really amazing to see. So Whitaker came up with this idea. And so at any particular point along the gradient, you could take a closer look um, and you can look at competitive interactions between those species um, and so on and so forth. And you can do other things as well. And that would be, um, you, could, you could actually look at an ecosystem level and measure things that, um, that uh, the function of, of the system uh, at that particular point. You can look at fungal, you know, you can look at, you know, things in the soil, you can look at decomposition rates and things like that. And as you see, um, as you go up in elevation, you get a decrease in biodiversity um, and, uh, and there's an increase in temperature as you go lower in, uh, in elevation and, and so on and so forth. So you can use these gradient analyses as what I like to call them a natural experiment. You don't, you're not a scientist going out there and changing the temperature. You're not a scientist going out there and changing precipitation. It's all being done for you by nature. You just have to find the pattern and discover the pattern in the landscape and these environmental factors. And then you can start looking at measurements in the ecosystem, whether it's a plant community composition, soil community composition, plant productivity, decomposition rates, whatever. You can then trace that to the environmental gradient. So does that make sense? But what about, met what about uh, taking this to a metropolitan area? And in the seminal paper in 1990, uh, Mark McDonald and Stuart Pickett, who happened to be my advisors, PhD advisors, um, wrote a seminal paper in ecology on using, urban, uh, using environmental gradients. And they called it an urban rural environmental gradient. Um, and I took that idea. Um, and I made it actually happen. Um, and uh, I was their first student to do this. Um, it sounds easier than it is, um, believe me. Um, but in the foreground in this photo, you see this canopy. That's the uh, New York Botanical Garden forest I was mentioning to you before. And then you can see the context of that forest is pretty urban. And so these environmental changes that occur in that urban landscape are having impacts on that forest, even though there was a fence around it 
and people and they had special trails and people stayed on the trails. It wasn't this really impacted area. So um, I'm going to step back now and talk a little bit more on how we can utilize uh, the urban rural gradient uh, to study soils. Um, and so um, as ecologists and soil scientists expanded their scale of observation from plot patch to landscape region and actually globally, um, they found more and more that they cannot ignore the human factor. And believe it or not, when I was in graduate school in ecology, um, if you went to an ESA meeting, Ecological Society of America meeting in 1990, there were no urban papers. And if you went to a Soil Science Society of America meeting, there were no, there might have been a one or two urban soil papers because I think the soil scientists are a little bit ahead of the ecologists, but it really wasn't thought of very much at all. Um, and so if we and uh, we step back and we look at this is a uh, Yeni's a classic. Uh, uh, concept of what are the soil forming factors, you know, if you go out in the landscape without people and if you dig a hole and you can look at that, describe the soil profile, why, why is that profile the way it is? Um, and so he identified climate, parent material, parent material being sort of the mineralogy of, of the rocky, uh, the rocky material that soil formed from, relief or topography, how old, how long the soil has been exposed to those other factors. And of course, organisms. And in particular, he was pretty much uh, recognizing that plants had a huge impact on soil properties. Um, and so there's some function of those factors that gave you a soil. Um, and so again, um, humans really didn't come in the picture until mid 90s, late 90s. Um, and uh, I could talk more about that another time, but um, but basically it, this is a relatively relatively recent idea that humans are having a big impact on soils. Now in agricultural systems it was kind of obvious, um, but that was generally on the surface of the soil. Um, but urban in particular really wasn't thought of very much. So in an urbanizing landscape, um, way back you know when they were doing soil surveys in the 60s and 70s and even in the 80s and 90s. Um, anything that didn't uh, fall under the, the normal soil category, they called it urban land. Um, and so in an urbanizing landscape, you would get this urban land designation along with these other soils. And you can see in this, uh, this view, um, the different soil types, uh, there's urban land and different soil types. Um, and these soil types vary by the, the parent material, which is seen on the cut, cutaway there. Um, so there's alluvium and there's semi-basic and mixed basic bedrock, for example. And then you can see topographical differences. Um, lowlands going up the up to the upper left, you're going up in elevation. And so soils are very much like plants. They're responding to these elevational differences and these other differences you see in the landscape. So what about adding an anthropogenic A factor? And so um, Several uh, of us in, in the 90s decided that, you know, we really should start taking this approach. And um, so we added the anthropogenic uh, factor A. Um, so how does that, ex what is the extent of these anthropogenic effects that we're seeing in, in, in the field? And one is temporal, so over time. And so we can think of a disturbance. So when people think of urban soils, they think of disturbance um, and some sort of management. And that disturbance relative, so it takes soils thousands and thousands of years to form. Um, so a disturbance, if you go out there with a, a backhoe and you start digging into the soil, that's relative, very short uh, temporal uh, uh, period in which you're disturbing the soil. So you're kind of resetting the clock in, in a way. Management um, impacts um, are generally take a little bit longer time, but in general, these are short term impacts. And so when you look at the soil factor equation, the A factor is really the thing that's dominating there. Th those, other, those other factors that um, Yenny talked about, um, they really aren't as important. Um, but there's another way that we impact soils and, and that is we change the environment. And I'll talk more about this in a little bit. 
And in changing the environment, um, you're basically working through the existing, uh, uh, the existing factors, climate, obviously, organisms that are there, the parent material, relief, and time. Time, uh, not so much. Um, so you can see, imagine climate impacts in an urban area, you know, global climate change has already occurred in our cities. Uh, I'll show you examples of that later. We change, we, we change the vegetation cover, for example. The parent material, we move stuff around. We incorporate new materials into the existing soils, or we remove the existing soils and bring in something else. And obviously, we're changing the topography. And then there's a spatial component. And so uh, the spatial component is a little bit more complicated to explain. But we can take these indirect effects, which are the environmental changes I just talked about, and then direct effects, which are those things that are short term, that have a physical impact on soils mainly. Um, and so when we think about, um, we know Native Americans were, uh, were North America for a very long time. Uh, and when the early settlers came, they didn't even realize that the Native Americans had been inhabiting some of these places because Native Americans weren't changing things all that much. And they didn't have this concept of ownership of the land. Um, and so when the early uh, settlers came to North America, they immediately started to parcelize, that's that parcelization under direct, the landscape, because it was based on ownership. Um, and when you do that, you start fragmenting the landscape immediately. And there's a change in disturbance in management regimes and so on and so forth. And so as the population density of these landscapes increased, those parcels got smaller and smaller, um, and there were more. There's more and more fragmentation, more and more disturbance in management. So you can think of that as a direct effect um, causes. But there are those indirect effects that I talked about before. We alter the environment, we introduce pollutants, exotic species, and there's this change in environment. Those things take longer to happen, but you overlay these things on the landscape and you get what I call the urban mosaic. Um, and in Baltimore, uh, those parcels can get really small. Um, and uh, when we were working there, I saw this sign, I thought it was quite, quite funny. Um, but this urban soil mosaic, um, here's an example of that. This is a landscape in Baltimore. And if you look at this landscape, that aerial photo to the upper right, you can see, you know, there's a lot of different patches in that landscape. Um, so there's a high diversity of parcels or patches. And that's because of that ownership thing. You know, when humans came on the landscape, we started breaking it up based on ownership. And that ownership directs what people do to their landscape, right? Because the person or the group that owns that landscape, they're going to do what they want to do there um, within limits, of course. Um, we have a lot of sealed soils. We've got concrete pavement. Um, and then what's really interesting and what I was really interested in as a grad student were these green patches. Uh, you can see the golf course, which those are bright red. Those are the golf greens and fairways. Um, but interspersed is real forest um, areas that um, uh, were kind of interesting to me because in, in the, in the in, um, like I said, in the Bronx, the New York Botanical Garden had an uncut forest of about 75 acres. Um, and it really represented a really neat place to study those indirect effects. Um, so uh, going back to that, that cutaway before, we've got this urban land, um, but we have these other um, soils that if you dig a soil pit, like in the lower right, a soil scientist will say, yeah, I can identify this. Yeah, this is a lagore. But if that's having uh, environmental changes occurring, if it's, start, if it's now under a changed environment, those indirect effects due to urbanization, what are the impacts on those soils? So getting back to the idea of a natural experiment, if we then could find um, urban uh, forest patches like I showed you already that you can, um, in an urban context, we can compare them to uh, forest patches that are in more suburban areas and then in rural and in rural contexts and rural areas. And if we can keep the other factors um, other than the A, so the A factor in that case would represent the environmental gradient that 
is introduced by urbanization. Um, and if you can keep the other factors relatively the same, so you all have the same parent material, forest patches with the same parent material, uh, same forest cover, um, you can then make these co comparisons like Whitaker did when he looked at species composition in the Smoky Mountains. We could look at various um, attributes of these forests and, and relate them to that gradient. Um, and then in the bottom, I show the full, um, I, the idea of the, uh, um, of the uh, urban mosaic, where you have um, patches that are being managed. Uh, we have patches that were um, disturbed um, over different sequences of time. So you can call that a chrono sequence, for example. Um, or we can look at whole ecosystems in the, these landscapes, um, like a forest patch, and measure what's coming into the patch, what's leaving the patch, um, like a watershed on the lower left. Some of you are very interested in, in water resources, so you, you, you would understand that. Um, and so we can start taking uh, uh, that, the, these patches that you find in the landscape as, again, a natural experiment. I'm not gonna focus on that at all today because um, Anna wanted me to talk about the urban world gradient. So I'm gonna look at the top, uh, natural experiment. But with these whole ecosystems, looking at a patch, we can look at it as a, a little mini ecosystem and we can look at interactions that are occurring within that patch. We can look at feedbacks that occur, um, like say between a canopy and the soil. And we can look at multiple factor effects. Not only can we look at a temperature gradient, there might be a precipitation gradient or something like that. So multiple factors. And we can also do regional and global comparisons. And if I have time, I'm gonna go and do this, uh, which is really interesting stuff and I've been very much involved with lately, but let's go to the, the other stuff first. So let's go to that natural experiment. And so we're calling, so uh, Yenny used to call um, uh, sequences uh, that um, a, a sequence where you would, he would, you could find in the landscape where four of the five factors were, uh, uh, were, were controlled um, and, and relatively the same. Um, and so you can then assess the impact of that one other factor. So example, you could, from a retreating glacier, you can look at different temporal sequences of soil formation as the, as the glacier has receded over the last thousands of years, for example. So that would be, um, oh gosh, what's a temporal gradient called? A oh, chrono sequence, that would be a chrono sequence. You can look at an elevational gradient in soil development. That's a topo sequence. And so here, we're gonna look at what I called um, an anthropo sequence, where you have all the five factors um, relatively equal. And the only one that varies is the context um, of, uh, the, of the forest, and that would be urban versus suburban and rural. So you can see that pictorially in the bottom. And again, it's a rural context versus an urban context. And we're looking at the impacts of environmental changes that have occurred from that. Sorry. My phone. Okay, so I'm gonna give you my, the first example and probably one of the better ones is the work I did for my PhD in New York City. <clears throat> and, um, in New York City, you could see in the lower part of the, the map, um, that's the Bronx, New York, Manhattan's further down. But I stuck to the Bronx because um, uh, geologically, it's very much similar to Westchester and, and Western Connecticut. And, um, uh, and so the point I'm trying to make here is when you do an environmental gradient uh, research, what Whitaker did, he did transects going up a mountain. And because he could do that because he knew that um, it was a pretty even um, change in temperature as you went up the mountain or precipitation. Um, and so you use distance as a surrogate variable for a change in environment. The other way to do this is to look at the context. And so, um, and I'll show you examples of both of these. As it turns out, urban development patterns in the United States are pretty fair. They're, more even than they're not, let's put it that way. And so by using 
distance as a surrogate measure, it works out most of the time. But sometimes um, if um, I would take a contextual uh, view, and so for example, in that forest on the lower right where I have the context, um, you can do a square kilometer around that forest and you can measure percent urbanization, you can measure traffic volume, you can measure all these kinds of things that relate to urban and use that to correlate with what you're measuring in the forest, rather distance from urban. So that's the only point I'm trying to make here. You could do it either way. The easiest thing to do obviously is distance. You don't have to take all those other measurements. And so here's an example of distance. And this is through fall nitrogen that we measured along that transect that I showed you before. Uh, this is with Gary Lovett. Um, and uh, Gary measured uh, through fall, so this is rain coming through the canopy, collecting that um, through fall and measuring nitrogen um, in the through fall. And we found that there was a lot more nitrogen coming into the urban versus the suburban and rural. Um, and that was kind of interesting. We kind of figured that's what was going to be the case because um, uh, NOx is a big uh, emission um, from automobiles and other fossil fuel combustions. Uh, things that you know take fossil fuel combustion and so this was not a big uh, uh, you know finding but we did it was really nice to actually measure it and you'll notice that the rural for total in organic M was actually slightly higher, higher than the suburban and it was because there was a power plant not far from some of our sites so that power plant was kind of ruining the distance relationship there and that's one of the dangers of using the distance relationship um, and the other thing is we found a lot of calcium coming in here. And I'm bringing this up because you're going to see it later on. And you can imagine where does calcium come from in an urban environment? Think about it. And we'll come back to it later. Oh, we're going to come back to it right now. I forgot I put this in there. <laughs> um, you think about all the cement that is used to build our cities. And cement um, has a lot of calcium in it. Um, and so as cement breaks down in the environment and blows around, it gets into our urban soils. And so it's a big, so you know, uh, anthropologists use phosphorus to, to identify where uh, ancient people used to live um, because they would throw the remains um, away and it, which was loaded in phosphorus. And phosphorus doesn't move in the soil all that much relative to other elements. And I've proposed that calcium, you know, to, thousands of years from now, they're going to use calcium to identify where we've lived because of all the concrete and cement. Okay, just to show you in other places, this work was also done in Boston. Rao et al., they also found this big uh, increase in end deposition in urban areas. And there's also atmospheric CO2 changes, there's soil temperature changes, there's air temperature changes. We all knew about the urban heat island effect. Um, and that has an impact on the soil. And so what I did um, in that transect, I took all the data from all these forests. And I did about, I forgot how many characteristics, 20 some odd characteristics. Um, and I just did a principal component analysis, which is a multivariate analysis. And it condenses um, variables that are varying similarly into a axis. Um, I don't have time to get into that, how it's done. But what it's showing here is that the, the U's are urban, the SU's are suburban, and the R's are rural. And, um, and what we find is lead, copper, nickel, the amount of soil organic matter in the mineral soil, 15 centimeters. This is all 15 centimeters, by the way, 0 to 15. Electrical conductivity, and there you go, calcium. Um, that was the urban response relative to the rural. Um, and we can think about where all these things come from, and uh, I'm going to talk to you a lot more about that in a minute. Now, again, you have to be really careful when you use natural experiments, because it's all correlation, or pretty much all correlation. I'll show you an example of what you can do to get around that. Um, and it's not necessarily causation. So this was an urban rural gradient results we had for Baltimore. Now, the difference in Baltimore than New York was we could not find a 
anthroposequence. We could not find forest patches outside of the city that were growing in the same parent material as the forest in the city. So that was a big limit in our urban rural grading approach in Baltimore. Um, and this just shows you an example, also a principal component, and also you see calcium and soil organic matter, for example, pop out. But you also notice these, the letters, the different letters are different parent materials. And that had a little bit of an impact, especially on the second principal component on um, texture. So you gotta be careful with that. So now going back to the New York City data, we using the multivariate analysis, we're able to differentiate urban from rural. There was a little bit overlap with the suburban. Um, but we can look at it differently. And that was by, you know, that was by distance before. Now we can look at things like traffic volume within a square kilometer of a forest patch. And we did this um, in New York City. And uh, you see um, pretty high correlations here, really high for lead. Um, and you can, you're all, uh, taking a course with Anna, so you know a lot about lead. <laughs> so I don't know if you go into this, other than to say that it's related to the use of leaded gasoline um, uh, in the New York City metropolitan area for a very long period of time. Um, and the other point about these, these measurements, I forgot to mention before, I don't have time to get into it as much, but it's beyond the splash zone from these major roads. So these so when you find lead in a forest patch where we were sampling anyway, it was beyond the splash zone from a road. So this was lead coming in on intermediate depositional processes. Um, uh, um, from the edge of a road, it's you know meters, um, and uh, and people have measured um, a deposition gradient there. But this is beyond that, um, and so this is a regional effect that's going on here as well. So um, anyway. That, that was just a little aside, but you could see that um, uh, the other question I have is where do you think the copper is coming from? And I'll give you a hint, it has something to do with automobiles. And that's where the urban sites were, and that's where the suburban sites were. For, so you could see that this worked a little bit better than taking the distance approach. We also looked at soil biota. Um, and so one of the things that you guys might be reading about are these Asian jumping worms. Um, and uh, we actually discovered these in New York City way back in the early 90s um, in our urban forest patches. Um, and I had to send these, uh, I didn't know what they were. I was familiar with Lumbricus, uh, Dendrobana, uh, more native species. Um, I wasn't familiar with these jumping worms, and I was like, what the heck are these, where they're coming from? Um, and uh, anyway, <clears throat> we found a lot of them in the urban forests. And as it turns out, they had a really big impact. And I'm going to go through this graph um, slowly, um, because what I did, um, you can measure decomposition rates in forests by taking um, screened uh, I should have put a slide of this in there, sorry about that. But we, we would make little bags of uh, window screen um, and stuff them with a known amount of leaves um, and also another chemical content. And we would place them out in the forest and measure their weight loss over time. And we can also measure the chemistry of that, um, of the change in chemistry of those leaves as they're decaying over time. And that tells you a lot of things about the microbial population and so on and so forth. But so when I first went out and uh, did the measurement um, of decay rates along the urban rural gradient, my hypothesis was going to be that was that the rural was going to go faster than the urban. And it was because the urban was, you know, polluted. You know, I was just starting to look at these things. And, you know, if you've got a polluted site, your decay rates generally go lower. Um, and that was the hypothesis. And so when I went out, I initially took um, leaves from one tree. It was a tree that was in a rural environment, actually it was right outside the, the house I was living in. I was able to capture all the same leaves. And so I used them in my litter bags that fall. Um, 
And uh, so therefore the litter quality was all the same and measured the decay rates over time. And I got much faster decay rates in the urban versus the rural. And I was like, what? And I, when I went out there and took a closer look, I found these worms. And so the idea then it was worms. But then again, I wanted to see what are some other uh, potential factors that affect decay rates besides the organisms that are there. Well, it's the, the quality of the litter, for example, is another would be another thing. So in other words, a pine needle would take a lot longer to decay than a, than a, a tulip poplar leaf, as an example. An oak leaf would take longer than a sugar maple leaf, as another example, because the quality of the litter is different. And so because these were all oak stands, um, and because I utilized my first study, sugar maple leaves from the same tree, I was able to keep the litter quality the same across the gradient, but um, not. But that was assuming that the litter quality wasn't going to be any different. So then I did a transplant study, and so what you're seeing here is urban and rural litter decaying in an urban site versus a rural site. Um, and the urban, in both cases, the rural litter, the rural litter went faster in the urban, and so did the urban litter go faster in the urban. And so we, um, we hypothesized that was because of the earthworms. But the interesting thing is compare the native litter. So the native litter in the urban would be the urban bar and the native litter for the rural site would be the one on the right, the darker bar. And that, that line that goes across, I don't show the error bars on here. Sorry about that, I should have. Um, it wasn't statistically significant. Um, but, um, and, and so if I initially gone out with my native litter decaying in the, in the native site, I would have found no difference in decay rates along the urban rural gradient. Um, the other thing, so using that sugar maple was actually brilliant on my part because I wouldn't have picked it up. Um, but the really interesting thing here is that the rural litter, the urban litter is more, uh, is less of lower quality than the rural. So in both cases, the urban litter decayed more slowly regardless of site than a rural litter. And so that was a big question that we would have never picked out if we didn't do the transplant study. We also, I also transplanted soil cores um, and uh, to measure nit nitrogen mineralization rates. And what you could see here is a big difference between the urban and rural soil in the urban site. And there's a big difference between the rural and the urban soil in the rural site. So the urban soils were primed for mineralization and they were primed for nitrification, but the rural soil would not nitrify at all. So again, this points back, we think, um, to the earthworms. Um, and so we also looked at earthworm and uh, mineralization rates in, uh, in Baltimore and we found a very similar uh, result. So uh, to continue looking at some functional responses, and remember, again, we're looking at whole ecosystem responses here. So that's why it's pretty cool to look at the forest patch. And here we're looking at, let me see if I got arrows. Yes, I do. Okay. So here we're looking at um, methane and CO2 flux from forest soils. Again, these are forested areas. This is now in Baltimore. And so we have urban forest patches versus rural. We don't have suburban in here uh, because this costs a lot of money. We didn't have enough money to do everything. Um, and so we can measure coming off, off the soil um, CO2 emissions. And we can also uh, look at the change in methane um, uh, and, and uh, um, fluxes as well. And so when you get a negative flux, like you do here for both the urban and the rural sites, it tells you that there are organisms in the soil that are using methane as an energy source. Um, and, uh, uh, and it turns out that forest soils are a big sink for methane um, around the world um, to varying degrees. But what was really interesting here was if you compare the urban versus the rural, what do you see? The rural has much bigger sink for methane than the urban. So the rural, the organisms that are using methane, and they happen to be archaea, 
um, and there's a couple other organisms as well um, that use methane. Um, and I'll come back to that later, hopefully, um, if I have time. But so there's a big ecosystem response here where you have um, less of a sink for methane and actually more CO2 coming off the surface in the urban versus the rural. So there's that functional response to all these changes. We can also do city comparisons. And so we can do a city comparison and here's the danger of using distance as a surrogate for urban again, but um, it still showed some nice results. In this case, we're looking at Baltimore, New York City. Um, there was New York City data, the data that I collected for my dissertation in Budapest, um, Hungary. Um, and you can see that the lead concentrations were higher in all the cities in the urban areas versus the rural, but to a different degree. So New York City, you get much higher lead levels. And these are forest patches again. Um, and you can see that there's an, oops, I thought I had an arrow in there. But you can see that New York City extends way further out than, you, than uh, the other cities uh, distance-wise. And that's because of the development patterns in these areas. And again, we find copper. And again, we find calcium. So now I'm going to ask you again, where is the copper coming from? Does anybody know? But this relationship we're getting with urban and traffic volume. Brake pads. There's a lot of copper in brake pads. OK, and then we did. Um, city comparisons using the contextual, you know, the context. And this, by the way, is considered more of an indirect gradient analysis. When you're using a transect and distance, it's a direct gradient analysis. So looking at percent urban, again, square kilometer around the forest, that relationship with lead and copper. Um, and you can also see that there's sort of a, um, in copper and in lead, there's a, uh, threshold. When you get about 75% urban contacts, things really take off. So that's an interesting um, result. So the whole ecosystem response that we're looking at along these urban rural gradients, um, and um, I'm showing you a very uh, old uh, diagram of, uh, of a forest ecosystem and nutrient cycling that takes place. Um, and so we were able to measure differences in atmospheric inputs. We measured differences in temperature. I didn't talk about ozone because ozone is very complicated. Um, maybe if we have a discussion later, somebody could bring that up and I'll discuss that. Um, there's litter quality differences um, and we're still didn't really figure out exactly why there were these litter quality differences, um, although we have a hypothesis and I've never been able to follow up on it. We could talk about that in discussion. Um, and we measured differences in decomposition, but it depended right, on um, what we used for litter. Um, and we had different fluxes from the soil, methane, CO2. I didn't show you the N2O data, but that was similar to the CO2. So we get this whole ecosystem response. Oh, I summarized it here, sorry. Um, and, and so here's, here's a summary um, of what we found. OK, so we can also go to regional and global comparisons. How am I doing on time, Anna? Okay, you have 20 minutes. Oh, OK, so I can do this. Good. So the other thing um, that we, we wanted to do, these, we were doing these city comparisons. We're getting some interesting relationships. And so we, we thought about regional and global comparisons. Um, and when you think about it, if you look at these photos on the left is Baltimore. And you can see there's a, that picture of a forest. Well, before Baltimore was, a, was Baltimore, it was a forest, primarily. That's what it was in the mid-Atlantic states at that time. When the early settlers got here, it was forest. Now, if you go to Arizona in Phoenix, um, I'm not, yeah, it was Phoenix, Arizona. And lower left photos, you see that the native vegetation was, you know, it was pretty desert-like, right? 
Um, but now you look at their landscape and there's trees and there's green vegetation. And the obvious reason for that is management, right? People, uh, when they plant plants in their backyard, when they move into these arid areas, they wanna have green around them uh, because they came typically came from somewhere else and they're used to having green things around them. And so this idea that humans are, when they urbanize a landscape, they're creating a landscape uh, that is much more alike as you go around the world than the native ecosystem it would it replaced, if that makes any sense. So for example, if you're Denver, Colorado, Denver, um, I don't have a picture of Denver right now, but um, hopefully some of you have been there. It's a great city. Uh, Denver, Colorado is in, you know, uh, short grass prairie area, step, short grass step, um, not many trees except for riparian areas. Um, uh, and if you took Baltimore, if you took the Baltimore area, it would be forested. But then when, when Denver was created, people planted trees because many of the people that were living in Denver came from somewhere else and they wanted trees. And so this idea of these managed landscapes, turf grass systems, planted trees and things like that actually creates a more similar ecosystem type than the pre-existing. So this graph here, um, this, this is a hypothesis that we came up with. Um, if you start, so obviously agricultural conversion is going to change things in your soil too. This is for carbon, soil organic carbon. And so the idea here is that um, the urban range for soil organic carbon is going to be a lot less than the uh, looking at different biomes across the world if that makes any sense. You're gonna get a lot more variance, variation looking globally at soil organic carbon in different biomes than you are if you just stick to the urban areas. So we call this the uh, ecosystem, uh, we call it uh, the ecosystem convergence hypothesis. And so we tested this. Again, um, you'll recognize Baltimore and Budapest um, where we have a lot of data, but we have some great working partners in, in uh, Finland looking in Helsinki, which is a big city. You all probably have heard of Helsinki. Lati is a little bit smaller. Um, and Pachastrum in uh, South Africa. And this is the global urban soil uh, eco um, um, ecology and education network. And so our study design um, for this is very similar, well, similar to the urban, it, it reflects the urban soil mosaic basically. And so you see in the lower left, it's a reference. So for Baltimore, a reference would be a forest patch, right? Um, in Pachastrum, a uh, reference would be a grassland because Pachastrum biome, before it became Pachastrum was, was a grassland. Um, and then we had these other uh, uh, land use, patch types that you can find in an urban landscape. And so we just went, we created that matrix on the right, disturbance low to high, management intensity low to high. And we just picked a few um, of those, um, in, including a, what we call a remnant patch, and then a reference outside of the city to compare it all, if that makes any sense. So that reference to remnant comparison is what I was showing you before uh, with the Baltimore and New York City data. Those are all forest patches and we were comparing them. So what we're adding here are turf and ruderal. So usually it, it's really highly disturbed sites, the ruderal. Um, and so we were looking at these and you can picture these now. Um, and you can see Pachastrum in the upper right was a grassland um, in Helsinki, it was pine forest. Um, in Budapest, it was deciduous forest. And these are ruderal examples. And here's a remnant grassland in Pachastrum. So when we take a look at these sites and if we compare them over the biomes, across the biomes and across those cities, 
uh, we asked the question, are we seeing convergence? And so the reference and the remnant would be the, you know, if we didn't have urbanization, um, would there be a big difference? And we found through across all these cities, no, there wasn't a difference. Um, but when we looked at the turf grass, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, the, the, there, there was, um, sorry, there was a big difference. <laughs> This is the coefficient of variation here on the left axis. So we didn't find, we found big differences across those biomes because they were very different biomes. We had grassland versus uh, pine um, and versus deciduous. And then the turf grass and rural systems in these cities were actually quite similar in pH. So that's the coefficient of variation here. So it was less variance here. And you can see it diagrammatically in the bottom. So the goes down. And so these are the uh, remnant and reference sites, which would represent the biomes. And you can see there's a big difference there. And these are the ruderal and turf sites. And you see there's not as big a, of a difference across them. Now, we could go, yeah. So we could go back. And we can take a look at these ruderal and uh, these, I'm sorry, remnant and reference sites, which is basically what we did in New York. So Lati, we found a bit bigger difference in the reference site in the remnant in, in pH than the other, and also in Pachastro. Okay. So basically, as we urbanize these landscapes, we're making them uh, higher in pH. And that, and that and I don't have the data to show you, but that's related to the calcium thing. We also looked at organic carbon and the same kind of thing. The turf grass and rural systems were very similar across these very different biomes. But if you looked at the reference and remnants, there are big differences. And it's exactly what you'd expect. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, there's a loss of carbon in this case, um, big losses in Helsinki and Lati because the native soils in these areas um, are very rich in organic carbon. Um, but if you go to Budapest and Baltimore, um, the differences between the, uh, the two landscapes is, is much less. And in Pachastrum, it actually goes the other way. And how did, I don't know. And then, same with microbial activities, and this goes back to the, the methane, so archaea are the triangles, and you see there's a loss, a big loss in archaea populations. Um, and uh, um, in these urban sites. 